Welcome to The Truth in His Art. I am your host, Rob Lee. And today I have the privilege of being in conversation with an illustrator, concept designer, cartoonist, and animator. Born in Tupelo, Mississippi, and raised in Clarksdale, Mississippi, he's a lifelong love of visual Afrofuturism, pulp entertainment, and action movies. Please welcome Tim Fielder. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. And you guys can hear I am in New York City, surrounded by the urban uh, sprawl, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, like you said, uh, uh, born in Tupelo, raised in Clarksdale. And that's where I am. Shout out to you. I'm in New York right now, though. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll be up there in a few months. So maybe, maybe if you're still up there, we can connect and uh, grab a coffee or something, because um, that's, that's that's how these things happen. All right. You know, and caffeine is good, man. Caffeine is always good. <laughs> So again, thank you for joining the podcast. And be, before we get too deep into the to the weeds, because I got I got a lot of questions, um, and because uh, I'm I'm curious, uh, tell me tell me the, the the Tim story. Tell me your story. Like, what's the um, some of those early visual experiences? Some of those early art experiences. Give me give me the story. Yeah. So uh, raised in Tupelo. I mean, born in Tupelo, raised in Clarksdale. Uh, my family, I always tell folks, uh, it's something my my twin brother and I were talking about because, you know, we, we're in film. So I have my graphic novel career, but then I have my film career, which is starting to transform a bit. And so we kind of almost got past the first body of projects and now we're discussing new projects. And one of our projects we're discussing is uh, along of uh, uh, Remember the Titans. Remember the Denzel Washington movie? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, so our dad was one of those coaches that was sent out to integrate the schools in the 60s. Oh, wow. Yeah, so he's 88 now. Uh, so uh, we were discussing that, and I'm, and I'm bringing that up to answer your question. So that was the kind of environment I was raised in. Deep South, mm -hmm. very much segregated, uh, and of course, you know, black people, we don't, first of all, we don't read. Notice, uh, three, uh four, or two, <laughs> listeners, I'm being sarcastic. <laughs> I'm being sarcastic, listener. <laughs> we obviously read, but yeah. we don't read, we don't watch science fiction, fantasy. We, we don't read comic books. We don't do any of that, which is obviously not true because that's what I do for a living. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, I did that for uh, from the age of four or five because my older siblings did comics. And as a younger sibling, they basically tell you what to do and you don't really have much choice and they just do it. So I stuck with that. And uh, that's what I've been doing now for as of last week, 56 years. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's that's dope. And uh, congratulations on that that longevity or what have you. Um, yeah, it's crazy, right? It's like, you know, I remember when I was 46. I remember when I was 36, but 56. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> so that transformed into around the age of 12, 13. After I'd seen Star Wars and been exposed to Heavy Metal magazine, I became um, an Afrofuturist. Yeah. It was what I call now as an Afrofuturist. But, you know, through the the aggressive encouragement of my older sibling began to more uh, 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 resolutely attack the idea of taking black culture and fusing it with science fiction. And that's made me like the wealthiest man on the planet. I'm like Richard and Bill Gates. <laughs> I'm being sarcastic by saying that as well. I mean, I, I dig the sarcasm because that, that's the thing. I do that as well as one of those mechanisms. Like, oh, I'm terrific. I'm I'm well adjusted. No issues at all. Yeah, you know, right. as, a, as a big black man, I don't run right. into anything. Everyone loves me. Right, right, right. Exactly. <laughs> so let's talk about the career path a little bit. Uh, and, and, and you were touching on it. So I think it's very um, apt to, to talk about it now let's talk about any any mentors you had or first jobs within the industry because you know i think a lot of times when there is something that you're doing and it's or something that you're interested in it's hard to find someone that's going to like help shepherd you or help give you advice and so on a lot of times we just don't have it and we just have to do it on our own i know that's what my experience was yeah uh pretty much the same for me uh I had mentors in the sense I had people who were elders who looked out for me, but they themselves were not part of the industry. Sure. 
Uh, so they could only go so far with it. You know, Tim, just keep going. <laughs> Don't stop. You know, but they couldn't give me industry-based experience because they themselves were not in the industry. You know, uh, and there's nothing like more comical than seeing a black radical from the 60s try to give you advice on how to be successful <laughs> in the 90s comic book industry. Whatever. They don't just uh, they have no context for that, right. you know. Uh, uh, but so there was that. Uh, and then there was pretty much having to make it on my own. I was never really part of any group. Sure. Uh, 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 I'm sorry. I should have turned that part off. So we do that. We do that. I think it's part of Zoom interviews now. That's part of it. But uh, uh, yeah, I just uh, what can I say? It's it's I've kind of had to make my way on my own. Yeah. Uh, the bad side of that is I had to make my way on my own. Uh, so every mistake in the book, short of, uh, let me knock on some wood here, uh, 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 short of jail time, I have done. Uh, um, um, I never, you know, so I never went that deep, but I had significant life detours. Although I kept working, always kept working my work, did my techniques went from straight analog to now I've been completely digital since 1998. Wow. Uh, and, but on the other side, because I've had to do a lot of stuff on my own or in my own kind of sector, you know, it's allowed me to, what was problematic decades ago is now what allows me to have a bit of uniqueness. Sure. Yeah. Which is weird. It's like, and you know, I don't want to drone on it because I know we talked about how long we want our answers to last here, but I'll put it this way. I've been doing this a long time, a yes. long time. Uh, and that's a beautiful thing now because I recognize, you know, you reach a point in your life where you, when you really are forced to take back stock and say, well, okay, what have I done? What have I not done? What have, this is the one of the things that I've done for decades mm -hmm. document. Uh, and so what it's me and meant for me as a visual Afrofuturist, particularly a visual Afrofuturist that works in comics, there's not a lot, a lot of us out there yeah. who've been practicing visual Afrofuturist in comics past 30 years. Right. A few old 10, few 15, 20, you know, 20s generally, but not some people who are in there. You know, I've been doing this for pretty much about 35 years. Mm -hmm. uh, professionally, since I got to New York City in 1987. Is that right? That's right. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh. Ooh. Yeah, I didn't mean to do that. I meant to say, yeah, I've just been doing it for like almost 30 years. It's like, you're at 35, 36, 37 years, fool. You're just, almost at 40 years. I'm like, it just turns oh, to 40. Oh, my God. Because, you know, you round it off. And I'm yes. like, oh, my God. So, yeah, a long time. But what it means is that I'm, I understand my context. I'm not the best out there. I'm, I'm very good. I, I acknowledge that. But it means that as long as I do my job from this point moving forward, I won't be forgotten. And that's everything to me. I love that. I love hearing that. Um, so I want to, I want to. D dive back in a little bit since we've been talking about Afrofuturism and such. I want to ask you about like, and, and, and I know it's rigid or people have different definitions of it, but how would you define Afrofuturism? And then I have that second part. That's a nice segue from that to the next question. So I'll let you start off there with the, uh, your definition or your, your thoughts around Afrofuturism. Well, I'll just preface it by saying it means a lot of different things to a lot of people. I have had to learn to accept that for me, because I'm in my lane. It's always been science fiction, technology, black culture, dealing and jumbled together with race politics. That's where you get your drama from. And you can tell stories within that context. But that means completely. That Afrofuturism means something completely different from those who are more philosophical about it, uh, who are more eth ethereal about it. It's, it doesn't mean it's not that on the nose. My stuff is pretty on the nose. Right. You're going to basically see black people in spaceships. That's what you're going to see. Uh, and I used to like, well, maybe that's not expensive enough. I'm like, man, whatever. <laughs> I draw black people in spaceships. I'm going to put them in there. They're going to look good when they're doing it. Right. <laughs> that's what I do. 
Uh, so that's what Afrofuturism is to me. Okay. That said, my feelings on it is that um, I'm of two worlds. The one world is it's early days yet. So the economy of Afrofuturism is still forming. You know, we'll see what, please, please, Black Panther 2 do well. <laughs> <laughs> right. We need to keep this train going, baby. You know, uh, so that's a, that's a trick. That's a thing we've got to get through. Uh, and then uh, on the other hand, it's early days yet in that there's a lot of work that I personally have to do in my specific sector, sure. like the Afro, the Afrofuturist graphic novel industry is in, in terms of the mainstream. I'm putting up my quotation fingers here. Mainstream is it's not that old. We talk about two, three years, three years. Yeah. And the mass of the books came out at the beginning of 2021, which my book Infinitum came out at that time. Right. You know, I had done self-publishing before, like a lot of cats out there do, but on the mainstream level where the big publishers are publishing this stuff, you're talking about the, the books from Megascope, my book all pretty much came out in the beginning of 2021. Yeah. Uh, and the Butler adaptations came out like 2016, 2017, just like two books. Uh, so it's not a lot of content out there. So part of what I'm having to do is to, whether I want to or not, I have to not just promote myself. I have to promote my industry. I have to build the industry from the ground up, which kind of sucks because now I'm having to be an ambassador for it. But, mm -hmm. you know, that's the job. So suck it up. Keep doing it. Yeah. And and, and I, I, and I want to ask about like how, and, and kind of keying in on that, how you feel about how it's been presented in like mass media. There have been shows that have come out, you know, I think of Lovecraft country, obviously you touched on black Panther and black Panther two coming soon and a few other things, but it's very, very minimal. So how do you feel like it's been like represented in contemporary mass media? Are you feeling satisfied in what's come out? Are you feeling like I need more of this? There's more stories to tell, namely with like Lovecraft country, like getting that one season and then kind of peace out. Tell me about that. Well, again, it's early days. It's so early. We're This will be a completely different conversation that people probably separate from myself, sure. you know, if I'm even still alive 20 years from now, will be having uh, uh, 20 years from now because it'll just be a different world. You know, hopefully we won't be walking around in a radioactive wasteland wearing leather or driving up souped up cars <laughs> in the desert, but... If that's not the case, you know, it'll be a scenario in which we uh, have been able to discuss 20 years of maturity. Got it. Yeah. I'm hoping that's the case. That's it. Um, you know, Lovecraft Country, I I've watched it. Uh, the most memorable thing for me with Lovecraft Country was the opening sequence where it felt like, and I've said this maybe once or twice before, when Lovecraft Country opens, is the main character having a nightmare in a kind of trench warfare yeah. thing with flying saucers and giant monsters. And I scream because I was like, oh, my God, they get it. They <laughs> may not last longer than a year. Yeah. So they said, whatever happens, we're going to put everything <laughs> in the tank. There won't be anything left. All You know, they say, keep your powder dry. They say, won't be any more powder. Everything yeah. will be shot in that first episode. And yeah. so that's what Lovecraft Country, the most important thing to me. You know, there were other things like the Hippolyta stuff. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yeah. Stuff that was important, not just for the character, but the performer uh, uh, with the, uh, my homegirl. Uh, uh, you know, she don't know. She knows my brother. <laughs> Uh, uh, she was in that with a King Richard, yeah. uh, Andy Ellis. Yeah, she's yeah. from Mississippi. I'm from Mississippi too. So, you know, shout out to her. But, uh, you know, it's just one of those things where there's, we haven't even begun to crack the surface mm -hmm. of the amount of stories and content that can be done. 
Right. And there are people who operate in different ways. Like, you know, the, well, this person here is in fine art. This person here is in comics. This person here is in film. But then you got this person here is slow as molasses. This person <laughs> here, they'll squirt it out their butthole in a day, right? <laughs> Those type of things all have to be taken into consideration. For me, I'm a product of Bond Desine, of, of French, the Franco-Belgian comics. Yeah. That mixed with the Kirby S, Michael Golden S type stuff in heavy metal, which is Franco Belgian, you know, at least in what's an offshoot of. Sure. And uh, so I'm not trying to aspire to do a monthly comic. I don't want to do a monthly comic. What do I want to do a monthly comic for? That's that's insanity. Yeah. For me. Yes. I want to do one kick butt album per year, just like the Franco Belgians do. Yeah. And make sure it looks great, the story is tight. Uh, people can relate to it. You do what you got to do. Maddie's Rocket 1 is out. That means next year, Maddie's Rocket 2 got to come out. Yeah. And I put it next however many years. I think I got enough for eight books, storyline. Uh, 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 I want, God willing, you know, from you know my mouth to what a God, what a, I don't know the phrase. <laughs> uh, I want to be able to see on my shelf, just like you see with the Herge 1010 books, mm-hmm. Maddie's Rocket 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. I love it. If I can do that, um, then I'll be happy. That's 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 great. I I like having that as the cadence. Like, you know, right now, and I think you and your brother were talking about it a little bit of how much stuff I'm putting out. And I was like, yeah, I'm riding that wave now. Eventually, it's going to be tapering off to literally weekly, maybe bi-weekly, because it's, it's just a thing where you want to put more into it. You want to do other things. You want to change. You want to change how you go about your work as you, you, as you mature, as you get older, as you're doing other things. And I'm just really riding off of only being 37 right now. But once I get get older, it's like, Oh, I'm done. I got nothing. I got nothing here. Well, I'll put it. And I say this a lot. You're going to die. I'm going to die. We're going to be worm food eventually. As my wife in the background going, oh, Lord, (laughs) it's true. It's true. And you had best get to it. You had best get to it Uh, because you can't take it with you. Mm -hmm. You can't take it with you. All you can do, only evidence that you will be here is what you leave behind. 100%. So you got to leave something for people to build on top of constructively or to destroy so and I'm trying to build something for people to say, okay, there's this thing. This was a cautionary tale, or this was entertaining, or this made me feel good, or it made me feel bad, but it made me think. If mm-hmm. I can do that, I'm good. So with that, we, we kind of talk about influences, and we we have these conversations on, um, like, this person is an influence, and we may steal from them a little bit, borrow, and maybe adapt, maybe do our own spin on what they're doing. Yeah. Um, tell me about like some of your influences, because I've read um, Delaney, I've read Octavia Butler, Pedro Bell. Um, so tell me about some of those influences, and really, like, what is it about them that you're like, okay, I can take this from here, or I like this particularly from this partic- this person. Tell me about that. Yeah, well, I'm a stealer. <laughs> I steal. I love it. Uh, uh, and people say, oh my God, really? Yes, I steal. But what you do is you, and I have to tell my students, you steal, then, uh, then modify. Mm-hmm. Right? So there's nothing new under the sun. There's, it is almost impossible to avoid, uh, to avoid influence. So you embrace influence and then you modify. And that's that is the way I work. Uh, uh, Octavia Butler and you know Chip Delaney, obviously huge influences. Presently, trying my best to to slowly work my way through this adaptation of uh, Chip Delaney's Nova, uh, uh, which you know, you know, he's eighty, so I'm you know I'm pressed. You know, get it done, get it done. <laughs> yeah, because I want him to see it, uh, and then. You know, Pedro and Overton Lloyd, both yeah. Parliament Funkadelic, were doing it when it wasn't safe to do it in terms of taking black culture and science fiction. But, they, you know, they, they kind of really were very much part of that. A lot of black speculative elements came through music. Yeah. 
which he, I even had my run with that, with the work I did with the Black Rock Coalition. And ultimately, uh, in the, in the late eighties, very, very early nineties, and then moving into the village voice, a lot of editorial cartoons and a lot of early hip hop illustrations. Uh, so I went through that period, but now we kind of, you, you know, I, I, I was asking my twin brother, I had gotten through infinitum, which damn near killed me. And I asked him, yo, man, what do you think I should be doing? And he said, only do work on books that you want to work on. That's it. Only work on projects that you want to work on. That's really, that is really, really, uh, uh, the, the, that's it. No, it's, it's important. Um, I'm, I'm seeing that now where people have their hands out. They, Hey, can you do this for me? We see that you're doing this and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, cool, but I, I recognize what's driving it. And I'm kind of working myself through having those hooks, having th- that different interest there, because it takes more and more from you versus being able to have these cool and interesting conversations with people like you, where it's like, oh, I can steal from you. I can steal from Tim now. I can steal from, from well, this You're talking person. about the money. You're talking about the money. It's like, I've done that, but I, <clears throat> oh man, how much time do we have? It's like, how can I make this? something that is a lighter lift for me. And that's not what it is. It's like, we want you and we want you to do this and so on. And it's not to sound ungrateful, but it's like, that's not what I'm really interested in doing. That's not the stuff that excites me. Me being able to do this and how I want to do it and when I want to do it, that excites me. I spent a significant portion of my life doing work for other people. Mm -hmm. And as a result, I've spent that same period of time doing a lot of work for myself that was never finished. Mm-hmm. I didn't really get around to just c- concretely finishing things, both spiritually and mentally, just until I was in my 40s. Right. Right. Uh, and now, you know, it is uh, an interesting thing uh, uh, because it allows me to to kind of pull together. Uh, the last question I have, the last real question I have is, um, tell me, tell me about diesel funk. I, I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get some, some background on that. Tell the fine folks and tell us about diesel funk. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, 2014, I guess, you know, cause I had started on Maddie's rocket, this book here that I started on, mm-hmm. but it was an animation. Well, it was a comic back in the nineties when I first created it. I was trying to do it with, uh, what's his name? Uh, Lou Stathis, who passed away from DC Comics. I was trying to pitch it to Vertigo. He was interested. I was producing pages, and then he died. I was dog. You know, so I tried that for a second. Then I went in, the industry collapsed in the late eighties and so on and went through animation. So I started doing Maddie's Rock. I, I re- resurrected it in 2009 as an animation. And for about three to four years, I just produced animation. A lot of really great looking, badly done animation. <laughs> right. And I was trying to do it as a web animation. And, you know, that kind of that kind of world kind of came and went. Uh, and but then I, I ran into uh, uh, my good friends, uh, John Jennings and Stacy Robinson of Black Kirby. Mm-hmm. They came over my house after a kind of a presentation they had given at Schumburg. They saw my stuff and Stacy, I never forget, he said it to me. He said, man, first thing that happened, this work needs to be published. I had, I had all my comics work I had done over 30 years in the hallway yeah. in the cases, you know, because, you know, I wasn't a comic book artist anymore. You know, I got out of it in, you know, 1999, 2000, 2001. So, you know, here we are, you know. And I was, oh, God, as soon as he said, I knew I had to do it. <laughs> so I ended up getting a deal with a small, uh, you know, with a publisher, uh, what we had agreed upon. But then it kind of had, you know, creative separation and stuff, which at the time seemed like, oh, but it meant like, okay, what am I going to do? Because this was October 2014. Mm-hmm. And, and I was like, all right, so this person's not in a hurry to do it. They don't have to be. It's their company. So what you going to do? And I was like, you know what? I'm going to do this book. So (laughs) I got the book done. Maddie's Rocket Book One, which was the floppy. And that came out in January of 2015. 
at the Schomburg Black Comic Book Festival, which I had been there two years prior as an animator. And next thing you know, I'm looking around, oh man, these black comics is they survived. Because you know, when I left, it was like, you know, I thought, okay, this is over. But you know, I tried to do the same thing in game design and stuff like animation. That was its own quagmire. But it turns out that all the skills I learned in animation and game design were directly applicable to comics. That's great. And uh, oh my God, my <laughs> life has just, it's just been, I think I've only had one quasi slow year that was 2017 was kind of slow. Mm -hmm. But 2015, 2016, 2018, 2019 was insanity. <laughs> 2020, during the pandemic, I was finished Infinitum in March of 2020 during the like the height of the yeah. pandemic. Yeah. And then 2021 turned into, you know, all this other stuff prepping so that by 2022, Carnegie Hall Afrofuturism Festival earlier this year with my career retrospective show Black Metropolis, which has been up since 2016, and TED Talks and panel discussions, and I've done more traveling. I used to have hair. <laughs> and, uh, dude, it is, it is, not only is it the most creative, creatively fulfilling part of my life, it's been the most, it's, I've never been this busy, ever. That's what happens. That's, it's, it's the, you put the work in, you get everything that comes with it. And um, I definitely... But no one ever told me that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no one ever told me that. I've been told by by folks that, you know, I was doing work with them before and they wouldn't pan me. And, you know, I was like, look, I can't keep doing this. You know, I got to, you know, I, I got I to gotta make rent. Uh, well, we'll buy your supplies for you. Yeah, that's... That's, that's great, but also... <laughs> I, I have this rent issue and it turned into something legal. Yeah. I was told, you don't finish this work, you'll never work in this industry again. Wow. Total mind job. Mm -hmm. They were obviously wrong. There you have it. So I think that's a good space for us to um, to stop um, on the, the real questions. And I want to throw a few rapid fire questions out there to you. Um, as I tell everyone, don't overthink them. Don't overthink them. Don't overthink them. They're fine. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to throw out a softball for you to start off with. How do you like your coffee? How do you take your coffee? Oh, very sweet, very light. Uh, okay. Ideally with the no sugar, half and half liquid because it doesn't have sugar, in it, but it gives you the feeling of the sugar. <laughs> I'm I'm straight just cold brew, just, just black. Black is my heart. Man, it tastes like brown water. Come on. Come on. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, if you now this is this is an interesting one because you, you have it you have a twin brother and there is some combinations. The names are very similar. I, I think Jim and Tim. So. Yep. If you had to change your first name, what would you change it to? Ooh, I've never been asked that question before. Uh, if I could change my name, I would change my name to Timothy. So because it literally is just Tim. No, Timmy. Oh. <laughs> it's not even spelled T-I-M-M-Y. It's spelled T-I-M-M-I-E. So wow. like I've said before, my name doesn't exist. You know, you have the chemical elements. Yeah. My name does not exist in nature. <laughs> so, you know, so my name is, I just shortened it to Tim. But, you know, I was like, you get pissed with me, you can call me Timmy. You know, but uh, yeah, that's my name. I don't know what my parents would think. It's like, could you just have taken like the five seconds to put the <laughs> O-T-H-Y on the end of it? But they didn't bother, so. I and, you know, that. after a while, you get a certain age and your parents are still with you. I'm yeah. not, you know, it's 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 been there. It's fine. It, it hadn't helped me back this long. So I'll keep it. Just a warning to my children, Joe. Do not name your children Timmy. <laughs> I, I have a, um, I'm a junior and I have a brother named Rudy. And it was very close to our names being uh, Ralph and something else that just did not work. My mom vetoed those. She was like, nah, absolutely not. Let's see. What, in what season are you most productive? Because you you touched on like it's kind of yearly, you know, as far as like being super busy. But some people are very productive in the summer because they like to stay inside. They're like, I'm not going outside. And some people are not productive because they're they're getting it. They're out there doing whatever. That has changed for me. I can't really answer that question. It really depends upon the event. Sure. Like I would certainly tell you, oh, I'm more productive during the summer. But then I just had this crazy 
book tour and I was at San Diego Comic Con. This has been an insanely busy summer. And now the fall, maybe it'll be a little bit slowed down, you know. To, but last year, this time, I was in, oh my God, September. I was in the middle of, of prepping for the Carnegie Hall Afrofuturism Festival. Yeah. And it was it was balls of the walls for six months. That didn't end to the last day. So my show ended, then I could take a break. All right, fair. Uh, this is the last one, last question I got for you. And I think, you know, I was sharing with you a little bit earlier about um, some of my action movie love. And I saw it as part of your bio. So what are your three, uh, your top three action movies? Die Hard, one. Uh, Bullet with Steve McQueen. Nice. And it just gonna sound so weird. The first Matrix is a masterpiece, man. It doesn't sound weird at all. It's, it's pretty fire. Yeah, but the second one and third, you know, it's like in the fourth one, it was like I was waiting for you to say the fourth one. <laughs> but, but the first one is just I was looking at it recently. I was like, this film, you know, twenty five years later, still holds up. It's really, really ama- amazing film. And and I have such a love of films that change. It's like the car chase in Bullet is the mm-hmm. blueprint for every action film that features a car chase in it. You know, uh, The Matrix, obviously, that goes without saying, Matrix has has had a, a, an incredible influence, but it's like North by Northwest. Mm-hmm. When you look at that movie, you see every action film that's come, it's just North by Northwest, just re, <laughs> rejigger. Yeah. And, uh, so yeah, that's why I love action films because they, they have the ability to have both the relationships, the drama and a little kick ass stuff in there too. There you have it. Um, I thank you for, for, for being on this, this podcast. Um, and I want to invite and encourage you to tell the fine folks where to check out your work, website, social media, all of that good stuff. The floor is yours. Okay, so Tim Fielder, uh, you can buy my books here. You can buy this one here, Maddie's Rocket Book One. You can go by all bookstores, Walmart, Target. You can order it online, Amazon. And then Infinite of an Afrofuturist Tale uh, from HarperCollins. Uh, all of my books can be found because the world we're in now, you can order everything. From any store, any online venue, you can even order it overseas. It's pretty incredible. Uh, it is my intention to hopefully, if there are no delays, uh, I think, well, th- let me say the, the intention is by, uh, New York Comic Con, we will have the ebook version of Maddie's Rocket Book One out and we will have, uh, the soft cover out, uh, and ready to rock. Uh, you can go to dieselfunk.com. Uh, for the web presence, Facebook is Diesel Funk. Uh, Twitter is Diesel Funk. TikTok is Diesel Funk. <laughs> Instagram is also hmm, Diesel Funk. I'm Rob Lee for my guest, Tim Fielder, saying that there is art in and around your neck of the woods. You just got to look for it. Mm-hmm.